What's an ideal day for you? Well, an ideal day is one of, I've talked to a lot of people and I think that's made a difference. I had several parents come up to me saying that my talks and my books have made a difference in their life. I think that's really important. Work I've done with animals. Uh, back in 1999, I implemented the McDonald's Animal Welfare Program. That resulted in great improvements in the meatpacking industry. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot better today than it used to be. That's something that makes a difference. It's making a difference in a positive way. Tell me about your graduate students. You have graduate students <coughs> at the university? Do you, how many I've do you have? I've got graduate students right now. In fact, I, the last phone call I just did was with my graduate student. And she's a veterinarian and did a very interesting uh, study on uh, veterinary curriculums. And there's a need to get a lot more animal behavior classes into veterinary curriculums. Because one of the main reasons why people will uh, give away a dog or even euthanize a dog is a behavior problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you do work with the vet school at Fort Collins as well? Yes, I, I'm a part-time faculty member at the Animal Science Department, and I do do classes at the vet school. I just did a, a two-hour class yesterday on welfare issues, uh, handling and transport of slaughter of, uh, of animals. Mm -hmm. I do do lectures at the vet school on cattle behavior. And cattle behavior. Um, what are you working on now in terms of your research? Well, I had a student that just finished up, Ruth Lolliwody, just finished up a big survey handling practices in large feed yards. And this is a place where there has definitely been improvements. You see a lot of undercover videos and bad stuff online. I've been around for a long time. Some of the videos they've got online now, they're training videos compared to some of the stuff that I saw. But Ruth went out to 28 feed yards and had good things to report. Electric prod use was down to 5%. In the bad old days, in the 80s, it was 500%. Mm -hmm. and, you, and she measured very simple outcome variables. How many cattle fell down during handling? How many cattle were moving their heads off in the vaccinating chute? How many did you poke with the electric prod? How many did you miscatch wrong in the squeeze chute? And then I can tell, is my handling getting better or is my handling getting worse? Mm -hmm. And she had a good overall report. I have a website, grandon.com, with a lot of information. I've got a book called Humane Livestock Handling mm -hmm. that's got a lot of that work in it. Currently, who, uh, what kind of companies are you working with? I, I know at one time when I was with you, you were off to, I think, China or Beijing or? Well, I've done a lot of work with McDonald's uh -huh. on implementing their um, animal welfare program. Mm -hmm. I trained their food safety auditors on how to do a very simple scoring system that I developed for meatpacking plants. Don't tell a meatpacking plant how to build it, but they got to achieve certain outcomes, mm -hmm. like no more than 1% of the animals falling during handling, mm -hmm. no more than 5% of the animals squealing or bellowing in the stunning area. If they want a really excellent score, they got to shoot 99% on the first shot, mm -hmm. and everything has to be dead when you hang it up. Uh, it's outcomes, very clear, really simple, like traffic rules. Mm -hmm. And that worked very well, and it resulted in huge change when McDonald's uh, made their, compl their suppliers comply with that. Um, in the movie, it, it did feature a, a little bit about you when you were in, I think it was Arizona, where you, yep, were, that's right. you were trying to sort of break down those doors of the idea about animal handling. What's some of the worst animal handling that was traditionally <coughs> done that you worked to change? What oh, would that have been? People were very rough with cattle in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Electric prods all over them, screaming at them, hit them, uh, just absolutely terrible. Things are much better today. There's a lot of people out now teaching a low stress stockmanship. People are getting much more interested in handling animals right. There's a lot of scientific research now that shows very clearly animals are afraid of people, gain less weight, uh, less uh, reproduction. Mm -hmm. There's good economic reasons to handle animals right. Mm -hmm. And it's also the right thing to do, because animals do feel uh, fear and pain. Another issue for me in the 70s when I got started is being a woman in a man's world was not easy. Mm -hmm. That was much harder than some of the other things. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where they put bull testicles on my car. That actually happened. Oh my gosh. Some of the stuff they call sexual harassment today is mild compared to some of the things that, that I went through. How about the hugging machine? Some, most of us know what that is. I do believe that there's some folks that don't know about the hug machine. I, uh, when I got into puberty, I started having horrendous panic attacks. Mm -hmm. A lot of us visual thinkers tend to have a lot of anxiety. Uh, 
especially the artists and visual thinkers. Exercise helped, but I also found that pressure helped, and I got the idea from a cattle squeeze chute that's used to hold cattle still for vaccinations. And so I built a squeezing machine I could get into that would help um, calm me down. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's really helped with the anxiety is a low dose of antidepressant medication. Mm -hmm. I've worked with a lot of really creative designers on various projects in the meat industry. A lot of these visual thinkers, I know a lot of them, they're taking Prozac too, <laughs> and it helps to keep them off the drugs and the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Visual thinkers and artists, they tend to be the panic monsters. Huh. And a little bit of antidepressant stopped it. In my book, Thinking in Pictures, I have a chapter called A Believer in Biochemistry, where I discuss um, you know, the benefits I got from antidepressant medication. Mm -hmm. And I know people that are designers where a little bit of Prozac every day is keeping them off the drugs and alcohol. And it's because of the, uh, the it, chemicals it, it, that what are happens, the biochemistry what in the body? What happens is, is uh, constant anxiety and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I learned from a brain scan that my fear center is three times larger than normal. Mm -hmm. And antidepressants should be called anti-fear drugs because they totally calm down the fear response. Mm -hmm. And it has to be a low dose. If you give too high a dose, you get agitation and insomnia. That's the big mistake. Often the label doses for depression are way too high. You've got to do a really low dose. I explain that in thinking in pictures. And even though that book's 20 years old, it's still accurate. Mm -hmm. The medications have not changed that much. The new ones are mostly what are just called patent extenders. Mm. The old drugs work just fine. Interesting. Uh, the equestrian center that is being built at, um, I'm assuming it's at, at your university. Yep. Um, how far along is that equestrian center? Well, it's in the planning coming? stage right now. Of course, uh -huh. one of the big issues always is money. Uh -huh. And we're looking for money for uh, help pay for the equestrian center. Mm -hmm. Funding is getting tight all around the uh, country tighter and tighter and tighter at many universities. Yeah. If you have free time, which I know you you fill your life, your life is full, Temple. If you do have free time, what do you enjoy doing? Well, I like movies. I went and saw the uh, latest Star Wars movie, and you know what I liked about that movie? The young people need us old people. <laughs> That's what I liked about that movie. And um, when I saw Gravity, Avatar, those are the kind of movies I really Maybe. like. Those are movies that you definitely need to see in a the theater. Mm -hmm. And there's others you can watch on a plane, but not those movies. Yeah. Are there movies that you don't enjoy? I don't want to see stuff with really graphic violence, and I want to make a differentiation. Okay, if someone shoots someone with a laser and it breaks up the wall and the person falls down, that's cartoon violence. Mm -hmm. But what's bad is graphic depictions of cruelty. I will read uh, movie reviews, and I'm going, I don't need that one. I don't want those images in my head. Because I'm a visual thinker. Yeah. Yes, I saw The Martian. Great movie. And the thing I liked about that movie is I looked into the history of that movie. That started out as a computer programmer's blog. People started reading it online. And then it was put on a 99-cent Amazon Kindle. And it took off. There are all kinds of platforms today that talented people can use to promote their stuff. Platforms that are free. And that book is a, and movie is a really good example of that. You take the kids out there that are kind of different, they can show off their writing online, they can show off their artwork online, their computer coding online. Let's talk about where we have shortages of jobs. Auto mechanic, diesel mechanics, welders, there are shortages. Those are great jobs for visual thinkers. There's also a shortage right now of coders. People can just do coding. And guess what? The classes for coding are free online. These are the sort of things I always tell parents. Your hot languages today are JavaScript, that makes Minecraft work, C++, Ruby, and Python. You learn those, put them up online on computer forums. But I want to caution you, it's your portfolio. Only put the good stuff up. Don't put the rubbish up. You might want to test drive your artwork, your programming with knowledgeable people before you post it. I'm seeing too many kids today getting a label, dyslexic. ADHD, autism, or some other label, Asperger's. And I'm seeing them kind of getting a handicap mentality. Uh, too many overprotective parents, uh, not getting the kid out doing things. We have got to teach work skills. That starts with kids doing chores at the home. But then as soon as they get, you know, 10 or 11, they need to start doing something outside the home. 
If you belong to a church, it could be a church job. Ushers, setting up chairs for the social. We need to be figuring out paper route substitutes. That needs to start in middle school. Walking dogs, but it's really important it's somebody else's dog outside the home. They've got to learn how to do work on a schedule. Volunteer does count, but it needs to be on a schedule learning how to work. When I was 13, mother got me a sewing job with a freelance seamstress, and I took apart dresses and I hemmed them. When I was 15, I was cleaning eight horse stalls every day and basically running a horse barn. I was doing some freelance sign painting. When I was in college, I did an internship at a research lab where I had to share a house with another lady that we rented together. You gotta stretch these kids. There's a tendency to overprotect. But I'm seeing bad things, like an 18-year-old honors student that's never grocery shopped. That's completely ridiculous. They have got to learn working skills. And it should start way before they graduate from high school. And maybe it could be a little uh, informal economy. You, you know, somebody has a little insurance office. Um, well, I, 11 year old could go in and help with some copying and, and doing some things on the computer in the office. Got to learn work skills. You know, one time uh, you, when I was with you, uh, you talked about your aunt that was on the farm in yep. Colorado. Did she play a fairly significant role yep. in your life? Anne was a very important mentor. When I was 15, the opportunity came up where I could go to my aunt's ranch. And I was an Easterner. I'd never been in Arizona. And I was afraid to go, but mother gave me a choice. And I think it's important to have choices. Not going was not one of the choices. The choice was I could go for a week and if I hated it, come back. Or once I got out there, then I could decide to stay all summer. And I got out there and I stayed all summer. Then I've talked to other parents where they start to push the kid a little bit and do something like do a sleepaway camp. And the kid found out that he liked it. You gotta stretch these kids. In fact, I got a new book now called The Loving Push. It's got a great chapter in there by Deborah Moore on video game addiction and how to deal with it. You've gotta wean them off and then replace it with something else. Maybe with auto mechanics where there's a ton of jobs. And you gotta stretch these kids. You don't do a sudden surprise. And there's kids that are labeled gifted, kids that are labeled autism. The other thing that's bad is I'm seeing uh, kids labeled autistic, that they're the same kids I see over in the gifted conference. Because I've made it a point to do both gifted meetings and autism meetings. And I'm seeing the same little 10 year olds. And in one meeting, he's clinging to mom and she's doing all the talking for him because he's an autism label. Then I see another little, little geeky 10 year old and they're at a gifted meeting and playing with a Brock Magiscope looking at leaves and things under the microscope. And they're the same little kid. And there's almost no overlap between the autism world and the gifted world. Because when they get a book vendor in selling many, many different books, there's almost no overlap between the gifted books and the autism books. And there should be about 30% overlap. 